everybody, and welcome to the next chapter of Percy Jackson the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. Today we'll be reading chapter 8, titled We Capture a Flag. <clears throat> the next few days, I settled into a routine that felt almost normal, if we don't count the fact that I'm getting lessons from Mears, Nymphs, and the Centaur. Each morning, I took ancient Greek from Annabeth, and we talked with the gods and goddesses in the present tense. Which was kind of weird. I discovered Annabeth was right about my dyslexia. Ancient Greek, Greek, wasn't that hard for me to read. At least no harder than English. After a, after a couple of mornings, I could stumble through a few lines of Homer without too much headache. The rest of the day, I, I'd, rot- I'd rotate through... I'd rotate through outdoor activities, looking for something I was good at. Cryon tried to teach me archery, but we found out pretty quick. He wasn't even good with a bow and an arrow. He didn't complain, even when he had to de-snag a stray arrow out of his tail. Foot racing? No good either. The wooden instructors left me in the dust. They told me not to worry about it. They had centuries of practice running away from lustre gods. But still, it's a little humiliating to be slower than a tree. And wrestling? Forget it. Every time I got on the mat, Carlise would herbalize me. There's more with that came from punk, she'd mumble in my ear. The only thing I really excelled at was canoeing. And that wasn't the kind of heroic skill people expected to see from the kid who had eaten the, who had beaten the Minotaur. I knew the senior campers and counselors were watching me, trying to decide who my dad was, but they were having an easy time of it. I wasn't as strong as the Ares kids, or as good as at archery as the Apollo kids. I didn't have his fastest skills with metalwork or, God forbid, a dynasty's way with vine plants. Luke told me I might be a child of Hermes. A kind of jack of all trades. Master of none. I got that feeling he was just trying to make me feel better. He really didn't know what to make of me either. Despite all that, I liked camp. I got used to the morning fog over the beach. The smell of hot strawberry fields in the afternoon. Even Even the weird noises of monsters in the woods at night. I would... Eat dinner with cabin 11, scrape part of my meal to the fire, try to feel some connection to my real dad. Nothing came. Just that warm feeling I'd always had, like the memory of a smile. I tried not to think too much about my mom, but kept wondering if gods and monsters are real, if all this magical stuff was possible, surely there was some way to save her, to bring her back. I started to understand Luke's bitterness, and how he seemed to resent his father Hermes. So, okay, maybe gods had important things to do, but couldn't they out call once in a while, or thunder, or something? Dionysus could make Diet Coke appear out of thin air. Why couldn't my dad, who, or whoever he was, make a phone appear? Thursday afternoon, three days after I arrived at Camp Half-Blood, I had my first sword f- fighting lesson. Everybody from Camp 11 gathered in the big circle area. <clears throat> Arena, where Luke would be our instructor. We started with basic stabbing and slashing, using some straw stuffed dummies in ancient Greek armor. I guess I did okay. At least I understood what I was supposed to do, and my leaf reflexes were good. Problem was, I could, couldn't find a blade that fit right in my hand. Either they were too heavy or too light, or too long. Luke tried his best to fix me up, but he agreed that none of the practice blades seemed to work for me. We moved on to dueling in pairs. Luke announced he would be my partner, since this was my first time. Good luck, one of the campers told me. Luke's the best swordsman in the last three hundred years. Maybe he'll go easy on me, I said. The campers snorted. Luke showed me thrusts and parries and short and shield blocks 
the hard way. With every sweep, I got a little more battered and bruised. He'd kick guard at Percy, he'd say, then whip me in ribs with the flat of his blade. No, not that far up. Whoop, lunge, whoop. Now, back, whoop. By the time he called a break, I was soaked in sweat. Everybody s swarmed the drinks cooler. Luke poured ice on his head, which looked like such a good idea. I did the same. Instantly, I felt better. Strength surged back in onto my arms. I sort of didn't feel so awkward. Okay, everybody circle up, Luke ordered. If Percy doesn't mind, I want to give you a little demo. Great, I thought. So I want Percy to get pounded. The Hermes guys gathered around. They were suppressing smiles. I, I figured they'd been in my shoes before and couldn't wait to see how Luke used me for a punching bag. He told everybody he was going to demonstrate a disarming technique. How to twist the enemy's blade with the flat of your own sword at that, so that he had no chance but to drop his weapon. <laughs> this is difficult, he stressed. I've had it used against me. No laughing at Percy now. Most swordsmen have to work years to master this technique. He demonstrated the move on me in slow motion. Sure enough, the sword clattered out of my hand. Now in real time, he said after I treated my weapon, we keep sp sparling till one of us pulls it off. Ready, Percy? I nodded. Luke came after me. Somehow I kept him from getting shot up the hilt of my sword. My senses opened up. I saw his attacks coming. I countered. I stepped forward and tried a thrust of my own. Luke deflected it easily, but I saw a change in his face. His eyes narrowed, and he started to pr press me with more force. The sword grew heavy in my hand. The balance wasn't right. I, was only, I knew it was only a matter of, t matter of seconds before Luke took me down, so I figured, what the heck. I tried the disarming move, man maneuver. My blade hit the base of Luke's, and I twisted, put him in whole weight into a downward thrust. Clang! Luke's sword rattled against the stones. The tip of my blade was an inch from his undefended chest. Other campers were silent. I lowered my sword. Um... Sorry. For a moment, Luke was too stunned to speak. Sorry? <laughs> His scarred face broke into a grin. By the gods, Percy! Why are you sorry? Show me that again! I didn't I didn't want to! Shirt burst of magnetic energy had completely abandoned me. Luke insisted. This time, there was no contest. The moment our swords connected, Luke kicked my halt and sent my weapon s skidding across the floor. After a long pause, somebody in the audience said, Beginner's luck? Luke swept the sword of his bow, brow. He featured me with entirely new interest. Maybe, he said, but I wonder what Percy could do with a balance sword. Finally, afternoon, fr <laughs> Friday afternoon, I was sitting with Grover at the lake, resting from a near-death experience in the climbing wall. Grover had scammered to the top like a mountain goat, but the lava had almost gotten me. My shirt had smoking holes in it. The airs had been singed off my forearms. We sat on the pier, watching the nids do underwater basket weaving, until I got up the nerve to ask Grover how his, his, how his conversation had gone with Mr. D. His face turned a sickly shade of yellow. <laughs> Fine, he said. Just great. So, you're still on track? He glanced at me nervously. Cryon told me you, uh, you, you, I wanted a searcher's license. Well, no, I had no idea what a searcher's license was, but it didn't seem like the right time to ask. He just said, you had big plans, you know, and that you needed credit for being a, keep, a keeper's assignment, so did you get it? Grover looked down at the nerds. Mr. D suspected judgment. He said I hadn't failed or proceeded with you yet, so our fates were still tied together. If you got a quest and I want a longer attack to, and we both came back alive, then maybe he considered the job complete. My spirits lifted. Well, that's not so bad, right? Bah, bah. He might as well have transformed me to stable cleaning duty. The chances of you getting a quest, and even if you did, why would you want me along? Of course I'd want you along. Grover stared grumbly into the water. Mask weaving must be nice to have a use for skill. I tried to assure him that he had lots of talents. That just made him look more miserable. We talked about canoeing and sword play for a while. 
and debated the pros and cons of the different diets. Finally, I asked him about the four empty cabins. Number eight. <clears throat> Silver one belongs to Artemis, he said. She vowed to be a maiden forever. So, of course, no kids. The cabin is, you know, honoring. If she didn't have one, she'd be mad. So, yeah, okay, but the other three, the ones at the end, are those the big three? Grover tensed. We were in close to a touchy subject. No, one of them... Number two is Hera's, he said. That's not another honorary thing. She's the goddess of marriage, so of course she go around having affairs with mortals, but that's her husband's job. When we say the big three, or we mean the three powerful brothers, the sons of Krona. Zeus, Poseidon, Hades? Right, you know, after the great battle with the Titans, they took over the world from their dad. And drew lots to decide who got what. Zeus got the sky, I remember, Poseidon got... Side in the sea, Hades the underworld. Uh huh. But Hades doesn't have a cabin here. No, he doesn't have a throne on Olympus either. Sort of, it does his own thing in the underworld. If he did have a cabin here, Grover shuddered. Well, it wouldn't be pleasant. Let's just leave it at that. But Zeus and Poseidon, they, they both had like a billion kids in the myths. Why are their cabins empty? Grover shifted his hooves uncomfortably. About sixty years ago, after World War Two. The big three agreed they wouldn't stare any more, star any more children. Their children were too power, just too powerful. They were affecting the course of human events too much, causing too much damage. World War Two, what you know, that was basically a fight between the sons of Zeus and Poseidon. One side and the sons of Hades on the other. The winning side, Zeus and Poseidon, made Hades sway on off. With them, no more figures with more women. They all swore on the river sticks, turned to boom. I said, "That's the most serious oath you t- you can make." Grover nodded, and the brothers kept their word. No kids. Grover's face darkened. Sixteen years ago, Zeus fell off the wagon. There was this TV starlet with a big fluffy '80s hairdo. He just couldn't help himself. When their child was born, a, a little girl named Thalia, well, the river sticks is a serious promise. Zeus himself got off easy because he's immortal. But he brought terrible fate on his daughter. But that isn't fair. It wasn't the little girl's fault, Grover hesitated. Percy, children of the big three have powers greater than other half-bloods. They have a strong aura, a scent that attracts monsters. When Hades found out about the girl, he... He wasn't too happy about Zeus breaking his oath. Hades let the horse m- monsters out of Tartarus to torment Tathalia. A steer was assigned to be her keeper when she was twelve, but there was nothing he could do. He tried to escort her with a couple of other half butts she befriended. The animals made it. They all they got all the way to the top of that hill. He pointed across the valley to the pine tree where I'd fight, where I'd fought the Minotaur. All three kind ones were after them with a horde of hellhounds. They were about to be overrun when Thalia told her s- star, her satyr, to take the other two half plots to safety while she held off the monsters. Uh. She was wounded and tired and, and she didn't want to live with a like a hunted animal. The satyr didn't want to leave her, but he couldn't change her mind. And he had to protect the others, so Thalia made her final stand alone at the top of that hill. As she died, Zeus took pity on her. He turned her into that pine tree. Her spirit still helps protect the borders of the valley. That's why the hill is called Half-Blood Hill. I stared at the pine in the distance. The story made me feel hollow and guilty, too. A girl my age had sacrificed her life herself to save her friends. She faced a whole army of monsters. Next to that, my victory over the Minotaur didn't seem like much. I wonder if I acted differently. Could I have saved my mother? Grover, I said, if he was really gone on a quest to the underworld, sometimes, he said, Orpheus, Hercules, Houdini, and they have, and have they ever returned somebody from the dead? No, never. Orpheus came close, Percy. You were not seriously thinking. No, I, I lied. I was just wondering. So a satyr is always assigned it. God, a demigod, Grover said me wearily. I had an Seated him that I really 
dropped the underwear idea. Not always. We go undercover to a lot of schools. We had to sniff out the half-bloods who have the markings of great heroes. If we find one with a very strong oil, like a child of big three, we look cry on. He tried to keep he tried to keep an eye on them since they could cause really huge problems. And he found me. Karan said you thought I might be something special? Verbal looked as if I just led him into a trap. I didn't oh listen. Don't think like that. You were you know you'd never be allowed a quest. And I'd never get my license. You you're probably a child of Hermes, or maybe even one of the mana gods like Nemesis, the god of revenge. Don't worry, okay? I got the idea he was assuring himself more than me. The night after dinner, there's a lot more excitement than usual. At last, it was time for capture the flag. When the plates were cleared away, the crotch horn sounded. We all stood at our tables. Campers yelled and cheered as Anna Buff and two of her, si- her siblings ran into the pavilion, carrying a silk banner. It was about ten feet long, glistening gray with a painting of a barn owl above an owl tree. From the opposite side of the pavilion, Curlice and her buddies ran in with another banner of identical size, but gaudily red, painted with a bloody spear and a boar's head. I turned to Luke. He looked over the noise. Those are the flags? Yeah. And Ares and Athena always lead the teams? Not always, he said, but often. So if another cabin captures one, what... What do you... Do you repaint the flag? He grinned. Here, see, first we have to get one. Whose side are we on? He gave me a sly look. If he knew something, I didn't. Garner's face made him look almost evil in the torchlight. We made a temporary alliance with Athena. Tonight we give the flag from Ares. And you are going to help. Teams were announced. Athena had made an alliance with Apollo. Then Hermes. The two biggest cabins. Apparently... Privileges had been traded shower times, chore schedules, the best slots for activities in order to win support. Ares had allied themselves with everybody else. Dionysus, Demeanor, Aphrodite, and Hephaestus. From what I'd seen, Dionysus' kids were actually good athletes, but there were only two of them. Demeanor's kids had the edge with the nature skills and outdoor stuff, but they weren't very aggressive. If a die's sons and daughters... I wasn't too worried about. They mostly sat out the activity and checked their reflections in the lake and did their hair and gossiped. Hephaestus' kids weren't pretty, and there were only four of them, but they were big and burly from working in the metal shop all day. They might be a problem. That, of course, left Ares' cabin. A dozen of the biggest, ugliest, meanest kids on Long Island, or anyone else on the planet, Crayon hammered his foot on the marble. Um, on the marble. Hey, Rose, he announced. You know the rules. The creek is the boundary line. The entire forest is fair game. All the magic items are allowed. The banner must be permanently displayed and have no more than two guides. Prisoners may be disarmed, but may not be bound or gagged. No killing or maiming is allowed. I will serve as referee and battlefield medic. Arm yourselves. He spread his hands and the tables were suddenly covered with equipment. Helmets, bronze swords, spears, ox hide, and shields covered in, coated in metal. Wow, I said. We're really supposed to use these? Luke looked at me as if I was crazy. Unless you want to get skewered by your friends in cabin five. Crown. Here, Crown. He thought the... These would fit. You'll be on board a patrol. My shield was the size of an MBA <clears throat> blackboard. The big creatus in the mid middle. It weighed about a million pounds. I could have sh- snowboarded on on it fine, but I hope nobody seriously expects me to run fast. My helmet, like all the helmets on Athena's side, had a blue horse hair plume on top. Ares and their allies had red plumes. Annabeth yelled, Blue team, forward! <clears throat> we cheered and shook our swords and followed her down the path to the southwoods. The red team yelled taunts at us as they 
headed off towards the north. I managed to catch up with Anna, but without tripping over my equipment. Hey! She kept marching. So what's the plan, I asked. Got any magic items you can loan me? Her hand drifted toward her pocket. As if she were afraid I'd stolen something. Just watch Curlice's spear, she said. You don't want that thing touching you. Otherwise, don't worry. We'll take the banner from Ares. Has Luke given you your job? Pat Border Patrol? Whatever that means. It's easy. Stand by the creek. Keep the reds away. Leave the rest to me. Thena always has a plan. She pushed full ahead, leaving me in the dust. Okay, I'm both glad you want me on your team. It was a warm, sticky night. The woods were dark, with fireflies popping in and out of view. Anna had stationed me next to a little creek and gargled over some rocks. Then she and the rest of the team scattered out into the trees, suddenly there alone with my big blue feathered helmet and my huge shield. I felt like an idiot. The bronze sword, like all the swords I'd tried so far, seemed balanced wrong. The other gripped, grip pulled on my hands like a bowling ball. There was no way anybody would actually attack me, would they? I mean, Lembus had to have a little, have a little ability, little, have a little, sorry, have little ability issues, right? Liability issues, right? Far away, the corn's horn, conch horn blew. I heard whoops and yells in the woods, the clanking of metal, kids fighting, a bloom plumed ally from Apollo, raced past me like a deer, Le leaped through the creek, and disappeared into enemy territory. Great, I thought I'd miss all the fun, as usual. Then I heard a sound that sent a chill of my spine, a low, a low canine growl, someone close by. I raised my shield in insensibly at the feeling something was stalking me. When the growling stopped, I felt the presence retreating. On the other side of the creek, the underbush exploded. Five airy warriors came yelling and screaming under the dark. Cream the punk, Curly screamed. Her ugly pig eyes glared through the slits of her helmet. She vanished. A five-foot-long spear, its barbed, wire, barbed metal tip flickering with red light. Her siblings had... Only the standard issue bronze swords. Not that they made me feel any better. <sighs> they charged across the stream. There was no help in sight. I could run or I could defend myself against half the Ares cabin. I managed to sidestep the first kid's swing, but these guys were not as stupid as the Minotaur. They surrounded me. And Curlius thrust at me with her spear. The shield deflected the point. But I felt painful tingling all over my body. My hair stood on end. My sh shield arm went numb and the air burned. Electricity. Her stupid spew was was electronic. I fell back. Another Ares guy slammed me in the chest with the butt of his sword and I hit the dirt. They could have kicked me into a jelly but they were too busy laughing. <laughs> Give him a haircut, Curly said. Grab his hair. I managed to get to my feet. I raised my sword. Curly slammed it aside with her spear as sparks flew. Now both now both my arms felt numb. Oh, wow, Curly said. I'm scared of this guy. Really scared. Flag is that way, I told her. I wanted to sound angry. angry. But I was afraid it didn't come out that way. Yeah, one of her, yeah, one of her siblings said. But see, we don't care about the flag. We care about a guy who made our cabin look stupid. You do that without my help, I told them. It probably wasn't the smartest thing to say. Two of them came at me. I backed up towards the creek, tried to raise my sword shield. But Grace was too fast. Her spear struck me straight in the ribs. If I hadn't been wearing an armored breastplate, I could have been school shish kebobbed as it was the electrical point just about knocked my teeth out of my mouth. One of her cabin mates slashed his sword across my arm, leaving a good-sized cut. Seeing my 
own blood made me dizzy, warm, cold at the same time. No maiming, I managed to say. Oops. The guy said, guess I lost my dessert privilege. <laughs> he pushed me into the creek and landed with a splash. They all laughed. I figured as soon as they were through being amused, I would die. But then something happened. The water seemed to wake up my senses. So I just had a bag of my mom's double espresso jelly beans. Felice and her cabin mates came into the creek to get me. But I stood to meet them. I knew what to do. I swung the flat of my sword against first guy's head and knocked his helmet clean off. I hit him so hard I could see his eyes vibrating as he crumbled into the water. Ugly number two and ugly number three came at me. I slammed one in the face with my shield and used my sword to shear off the the other guy's horsehair plume. Both of them backed up quick. Ugly number four didn't look really anxious to attack, but Khalees kept coming. The point of her spear crackling with energy. As soon as she thrust... I caught the shift between the edge of my shield and my sword. I snapped it like a twig. Ah! She screamed, you idiot! You corpse breath warm! She probably would have said worse, but I smacked her between the eyes with my sword butt and sent her stumbling backward out of the creek. Then I heard yelling, elated screams, and I saw Luke racing toward the boundary line with the red team's banner lifted high. He was flecked flanked by a couple of Hermes guys covering his retreat, and a few Apollos behind them, fighting off the Festus kids. The Aerosos got up, and Khalees muttered a dazed curse. A trick! She shouted. It was a trick! They st- staggered after Luke, but it was too late. Everybody converged on the creek as Luce ran acro- across into friendly territory. Out our side exploded into cheers. The rib... The red banner shimmered and turned to silver. Board head were replaced with a huge caddies. The symbol of cabin 11. Everybody on the blue team picked up Luke and started carrying him around on their shoulders. Crayon. Cannoned out from the woods and blew the corn horn. Game was over. We'd won. It was about, I was about to join the celebration when Annika's voice right next to me came in, right next to me came in the creek and said, Not bad, hero. She, I looked, but she wasn't there. Where the heck did you learn to fight like that? She asked. The air shimmered and she materialized, holding a Yankees baseball cap as if she'd just taken it off her head. I felt myself getting angry. I was even faced by the fact she'd just been invisible. You, you set me up. I said, you put me here because you knew Curlice would come after me. Well, you sent Luke around the flank. You had it all figured out. Ember shrugged. Told you Athena always has a plan. Plan to get me purbalized? I came as, as I could. I was about to jump on in, but she shrugged. You didn't need help. Then she noticed my wounded arm. How did you do that? Sword cut, I said. What do you think? No, it, it, it was a sword cut. Look at it. The blood was gone. Or the huge cut had been. There was a long white scratch. Even that was fading. As I watched it turn into a small scar and disappeared. I, 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 I don't get it. I said, and I was thinking hard. I could almost see the gears turning. She looked down at my face, feet. Then at Curly's broken spear and said, Step out of the water, Percy. What? Just do it. I came out of the creek and immediately felt bone tired. My arms started to go numb again. My adrenaline rush left me. I almost fell over, but Annabeth, Annabeth st- steadied me. Oh, sticks, she cursed. This is not good. I didn't want... I assumed it would be Zeus before I could ask what she meant. I heard that canine growl again, but much closer than before. A howl ripped through the forest. The campus cheering died instantly. Cryon shouted something in ancient Greek, which I would realize only later I had understood perfectly. Stand down, my bow. Annabeth drew her sword. There on the rocks, just above us, was a black hound, size of a rhino, with lava red eyes and fangs like daggers. It was like looking 
straight at me. Nobody moved except Annabeth, who yelled, Percy, run! She tried to step in front of me, but the hound was too fast. It leaped over her, enormous shadow with teeth. And just as it hit me, I stumbled backward and felt its razor-sharp claws ripping through my armor. There was a cascade of thrunking sounds, like forty pieces of paper being ripped one after the other. The hound's neck sprouted a cluster of arrows. The monster fell dead at my feet. By some miracle, I was still alive. I didn't want to look underneath the ruins of my shredded armor. My child felt warm and wet, and I knew I was badly cut. Another second, and the monster would have turned me into a hundred pounds of discolating this del skin and meat. Crayon trotted up next to us, a bow in his hand. His face grim. Diamortis, Annabeth said. That's hellhound from the fields of punishment. They didn't, they're not supposed to. <clears throat> Some, somebody summoned it, Cran said. Somebody inside the, someone inside the camp. Luke came, came over the, the banner in his hand for dark. His moment of glory gone. Cryon yelled. I mean, Curlice yelled. It's all Percy's fault. Percy summoned it. Be quiet. <clears throat> Be quiet. Be quiet, child. Cryon told her. He watched the body of the hellhound melt into shadow and soaking into the ground until it disappeared. You're wounded, and have told me. Quick, Percy, get in the water. I'm okay. No, you're not, she said. Cryon, watch this. I was too tired to argue. I stepped back into the creek. The whole camp gathering around me. Instantly, I felt better. I could feel the cuts on my chest closing up. Some of the campers gasped. Look, I, look, I, I don't know why. I, I said, trying to apologize. I'm sorry, but they weren't watching my wounds heal. They were staring at something above my head. Percy, I said, pointing. Um, by the time I looked up, the sign was already fading. But I could still make out the hologram. Green light, spinning and gleaming, a three-tipped spear, a trident. Your father, Enfus murmured, this is really not good. It is determined, Cryon announced. All around me, campers started kneeling, even the Ares cabin, though they didn't look happy about it. <laughs> My father, I asked, completely bewildered. Poseidon, said Cryon, earth shaker. Stormbringer, father of horses, hell, Perseus Jackson, sea, son of the sea god. And that's the end of chapter 8. Like and subscribe and comment in the description. Goodbye!